Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to yet another coffee shop talk. Uh, we're going to get started right now. And as always, if you have an idea for a future coffee shop talk, please visit our website and fill out our suggestion form, and maybe we'll talk about it in a future talk. Um, also, if you happen to be in the Madison area November 14th, we recommend that you check out their Astronomy on Tap talk. Astronomy on Tap is a group of uh, graduate students at UW-Madison, similar to us, who do uh, talks on uh, science and astronomy-related topics. Now, who are we? We are Coffee Shop Astrophysics. We are a group of physics grad students at the Leonard E. Parker Center for Gravitation, Cosmology, and Astrophysics at UWM. And today, your speakers are myself, Lulu Agazi, Gabe Friedman, and Shashwat Sardesai. And today, our talk is going to be about tuning into the Universal Symphony, the gravitational wave background discovery. Now, you may have heard in the news this past summer, there was a lot of press coverage about this new discovery that astronomers made about this background hum coming from our universe. We even got covered in the New York Times. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this discovery was, which was the first evidence for the gravitational wave background. Now, to walk back a little bit, gravitational waves are these ripples in space-time that are caused by massive accelerating objects. And the gravitational wave background is the collective hum of all these sources of these gravitational waves from the most massive objects in our universe. Oh, went too far. And um, this discovery was a global effort. Uh, there were collaborations all over the world, regional ones in North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and they all came together in a global collaboration called the International Pulsar Timing Array, or IPTA. We'll get a little bit into what those words mean later. Now, in today's talk, we're going to be specifically talking about the work done by the North American Group, also known as the Nano sorry, North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, or Nanograv for short. And our speakers today, myself, Gabe, and Shashwat, are all members of this scientific collaboration and are one of the many people who helped work towards this result. Now, how did we go about detecting the gravitational wave background? We used our galaxy as a gravitational wave background, or GWB, as I'll call it throughout the talk, uh, as a detector. And we did this through something that's called a pulsar timing array. And I'll walk through what each of those words mean. First off, what is a pulsar? A pulsar is a type of neutron star. Neutron stars form when um, dead stars that have gone supernova collapse down, and their cores um, end up becoming really, really dense and spinning re really, really fast. And um, they're compacted so much that they're composed almost entirely of neutrons. Um, usually, in order for a star to eventually become a neutron star, it would have had to have been about 10 to 20 times the mass of our sun. Uh, pulsars, they have really strong magnetic fields, um, upwards of a billion times stronger than Earth, and they can spin really, really fast. Um, in some cases, as fast as 1.3 milliseconds to make one rotation. And to give you an idea of how fast that is, that would be about 46,000 RPM. And these stars are also incredibly small. They tend to be about 1.4 times the mass of our sun, but they're compacted into an area that's about 20 um, miles in diameter. So if we were to take a neutron star and stick it over anodyne, mind you, you wouldn't want to do that because the magnetic field would probably rip us apart, but this is about how big it would look. And because these stars are so small and they're also really far away, we can't really look at them by just looking at the sky in light that we can see. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum represents all the different wavelengths of light that, that exist, down from really small wavelengths to really long wavelengths. Uh, a wavelength is if, say, you think of light as a wave, a wavelength would be the amount of space between two of those peaks of the, of the wave. And visible light represents a very tiny amount of, of light that we can see. When we look at pulsars, we actually look at these really long wavelengths in the radio regime, and these are wavelengths that are anywhere from centimeters to tens of meters. And um, because we can't look at them th through optical means, we have to use special radio telescopes to look at them. So they usually, most radio telescopes consist of a giant dish, which the radio waves bounce off of, and then they go into a receiver. 
Uh, this particular radio telescope is the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. Now, next off, what is pulsar timing? As I mentioned before, pulsars spin really, really rapidly, and this spin period is really, really stable with accuracy comparable to atomic clocks. Um, and they also emit these beams of radiation from their magnetic poles, uh, which we observe as a pulse, hence the name pulsar. Uh, whenever we're observing pulsars, we see this radiation as a bunch of little pulses that go from the pulsar all the way to our uh, uh, telescope. And when we, we can use the, these pulses and record what time they arrive, and we call this a time of arrival or a TOA. And we can use these TOAs to infer characteristics about the pulsar. This can be how fast it's spinning, how much its spin period changes over time, where it is in the sky, how far away it is, uh, whether it's in a binary with another star. And we can use that to make a model, which we call a timing ephemeris, to predict when we think TOAs should be observed. And the point of ti pulsar timing is to make tweaks to that model until when we expect the TOAs to um, be observed matches up with when we actually see them. A pulsar timing array is when we take many, many of these pulsars um, and we observe them and time them over really long periods of time in order to look at correlated signatures in those times of arrivals. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about, now that we've gotten a little bit into the background, I'm going to talk about how you would actually go about building a pulsar timing array. And the first thing is, of course, to find some pulsars. And we have a lot to choose from. There's about 3,400 discovered pulsars, um, but not every pulsar was necessarily going to work for a pulsar timing array. Um, first of all, um, even though pulsars are really stable rotators, not all of them are quite as stable as the others. We tend to pick millisecond pulsars, which are pulsars that have spin periods about less than 40 milliseconds, and they also have very um, small spin down rates. So in this plot, I've shown what the population of pulsars look like. In order to categorize them, we tend to use these plots called period-period derivative plots where our x-axis is a pulsar spin period and our y-axis is its period derivative or how long it takes to slow down. And if you look at this, the spin periods are on the orders of milliseconds to tens of seconds, but the uh, spin down rates are anywhere from 10 to the minus 10 or 0 0.10 zeros 1 to um, 10 to the minus 22. So even though these, are, these pulsars are slowing down, they are taking much, much longer to slow down relative to how fast they spin. Um, another thing that we want to make sure is that we can time them really well, that we can model these pulsars really well, so that when we use them to search for the GWB, we're able to um, model out anything that's not the GWB. We also want to make sure that pulsars are not in globular clusters. Now, this might be a weird question, but globular clusters are actually areas where we can find many pulsars. However, um, in a globular cluster, you have a lot of stars that are bound together by gravity, and these tend to be dominated by the effects of, their near of the nearby stars in the globular cluster, so they're not super great candidates for using in PTA timing. And we, they also have to be easy to observe. Some pulsars are harder to observe than others. Sometimes we might observe a particular pulsar only 15% of the time we observe it, and that's not a good use of our observing time. So our next step, in once we've identified the pulsars that we want to use in our PTA, is we want to observe them for a really long time. And in Nanograv's PTA, um, in our most recent 15-year data release, we have data from three different telescopes. Uh, the Green Bank Telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, the Arecibo Telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, and the Very Large Array in uh, near Socorro, New Mexico. Now, how long do we need to observe these pulsars or take observations of these pulsars? Uh, when we want to search for the GWB, we're looking for processes that might take anywhere from 5 to 20 years. So if we think of the GWB as, again, as a wave, the, um, the amount of time between each of those peaks could be anywhere from 5 to 20 years. So we want our data set to be at least as long as that so we know what we're seeing is the GWB. And our nanograms data set has been growing for a really long time. Now in this um, diagram, all of these dots represent a different observation of a pulsar. I realize they kind of look like lines here, but that's just because there's so many observations close, uh, packed close together. 
And each of these lines represents a different pulsar. And each of these boxes represent each of Nanograv's uh, data releases. <coughs> from the first uh, five-year data set release in 2013 all the way to the 15-year data release earlier this year. <coughs> uh, and between um, the 15-year data release and the most recent 12 and a half year data release, we've actually had one of the biggest uh, um, increases in the number of sources we look at with about 21 pulsars being added to the array between the 12 and a half and 15-year data set. So this data set has not just been growing in time, but also in sources. Uh, in the 15-year data set, there's about 68 pulsars. The next step is we do the timing. We've, we have all these pulsars. We've been observing them for long periods of time. Now we need to time them. And we do that, uh, and when we uh, want to use pulsars for PTA science, we need to time them really, really precisely. Now, the gravitational wave background is something that's going to be observable across all pulsars. So we, what we want to do is say, we want to understand everything about the pulsar that is happening at a single source level. And one way we do this is um, looking at something called TOA residuals. And that represents the difference between when our timing models think a TOA is going to arrive and when we actually observe it. So for example, this is a pulsar where we have timing residuals that are on the order of about five microseconds, but they're mostly clustered around zero, which is what we want. And also, this is a pulsar with a spin period of about 5.2 milliseconds. So there's about 1,000 microseconds in a millisecond. So the important thing to get from this is that the um, residuals or the uncertainty in our measurement between when we see a TOA and when we expect to see it is a very, very small percentage of the pulsar's actual spin period. That tells us that we're timing this very precisely. And next step, now that we've done the timing, we found our pulsars, we've observed them for a really long time, we're gonna search for the DWB. And in this uh, video, this shows um, all the pulsars in Nanograv's uh, PTA and also shows, will show in a moment, where we are relative to, uh, relative to these pulsars within our galaxy. And all these lines just represent um, pulsar, sorry, sorry, just represent um, potential arms of our pulsar timing array. And you can see that we actually, even though we're technically using the galaxy as our GWB detector, detector we actually represent a pretty small portion of the entire galaxy we could be looking at. And with that, I'll hand it over to Gabe. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you to uh, Lulu for that introduction on pulsars and how we're able to take these very cool exotic objects in space and turn them effectively into a detector the size of our own galaxy. What I'm now going to do is, instead of talking about the detector, I'm going to remind us of what we're actually detecting. And that is gravitational waves, and I'll be spending this period of time talking about gravitational waves and their sources, at least the ones that we are interested in, in Nanograph. So, just one slide on the theory. That's all really that I want to provide here, maybe a slide and a half. But just a reminder is what Lulu said, is that gravitational waves are sort of ripples in the real fabric of space-time that are generated by massive accelerating objects. They are a direct consequence of Einstein's theory of general relativity, a theory that pretty much forms the basis of my research and a lot of the research that, that goes on in the CGCA and coincidentally is not even what Einstein won the Nobel Prize for. Um, but within Einstein's theory of GR, we have sort of two what's called polarizations of gravitational waves. And I just want you to think about it as to how it would affect if you just had a ring of particles, a nice circle of particles and a gravitational wave were to pass through it, how would those particles sort of bend, squeeze, stretch, et cetera. And the two um, polarizations that are allowed in GR I have shown here, H plus and H cross are the names that we give to them. But you can see as time would go across, as a gravitational wave would pass uh, by that ring of particles, how either one of these polarizations would affect the ring and sort of squeeze it in a particular direction. Um, but when it comes to gravitational waves, these are inherently different from maybe electromagnetic waves that we're looking for. So an electromagnetic wave, you can think of how we might actually measure that. We're doing emission spectra. We're looking for maybe the amplitude of that wave. But what are we doing when it comes to gravitational waves? And the answer to what we're actually measuring here, and for the most part, is this quantity that we like to consider the strain. At least we're going to call it the strain. It's some way that we can kind of measure or quantify the, the wobbling of 
those uh, rings of particles that I showed in the previous slide and that I have again shown here. So this is what we call the gravitational wave strain. I've got the equation there. You don't have to worry about it. There's no quiz afterwards. Uh, but you can think of this more as analogous to the, to the amplitude of that gravitational wave. It's, it's essentially very, very similar to that. Uh, however, I should be very clear that this isn't actually what we are measuring in pulsar timing arrays. Uh, so what are pulsar timing arrays actually measuring? They're not measuring that, that strain explicitly. It's more how it affects those times of arrivals, the pulse, the, uh, when we're getting those pulses that Lulu talked about. What these passing gravitational waves are doing is they're affecting those times of arrival to either get to us here on Earth a little bit earlier or a little bit later than we actually expected. So instead of that raw strain value from the previous slide that I showed you, what we're actually uh, measuring and using in our data to try and uh, search for gravitational wave background is more the change in those times of arrival, which can be directly linked to uh, the gravitational wave strain. And if you just do a quick uh, couple of calculations, you can find that on average that, uh, that delta T or that change in the time of arrival is just going to be on the order of nanoseconds, which makes sense because, I mean, nanos in basically every single part of our collaboration, the name, the frequency, everything, so on and so forth. All right. To get a better idea of the gravi of gravitational waves and the frequencies that we're looking at, we should at least draw it back uh, to our old analog, our old friend, the electromagnetic spectrum. So some version of this slide, we have, I don't know, three out of every four talks or so here, we're showing you something approximately like this, that electromagnetic waves cover a whole spectrum of various frequencies from radio waves and microwaves, infrared. We've even got the little tiny visible spectrum up there. And it can go all the way up to very high frequency stuff like gamma rays. And we can take a measurement just with gamma rays. We can take a measurement just with radio waves or anything in the middle and get sort of one image of one particular object or a set of objects. But where we can get some very interesting results um, is if we maybe take the same exact uh, object, or in this case, looking along the plane of our Milky Way, and measure the same thing across multiple wavelengths. So this is the galactic plane of our own Milky Way, taken in, in uh, radio wavelength observations, microwave observations, all the way down to gamma ray observations. And you can see that just as you change and move along the electromagnetic spectrum and take different measurements, you get different information. You see the same object literally in different lights, and you're able to learn more about it through sort of the concatenation of all of these uh, observations. And the point I'm trying to make here is that multiple observations of the same object can end up giving you more information. Well, what if there were multiple messengers in this case? You can take a lot of different observations with light, with EM light, but that's not the only uh, set of messengers from space that we can measure. There are particles, uh, neutrinos, and various experiments you can do to measure those. And of course, at the bottom, gravitational waves are a separate uh, messenger all in their own right. So I then say, wouldn't it be great if we could then use multiple messengers to study the same objects and have sort of this thing, multi-messenger astrophysics? Well, guess what? That actually already is a thing ever since uh, the first discovery of gravitational waves by LIGO, maybe seven-ish years ago, that looking at the same object in electromagnetic waves and also in gravitational waves can be a huge boon for scientists trying to study some of the most exotic objects out in space. So now we're going to look at our new friend, the gravitational wave spectrum, and kind of build up what this might look like. Again, uh, frequency increasing to the right here. We're actually going to start all the way over on the right with the high frequency sources. Well, that's actually what I just mentioned. That's what uh, LIGO, the uh, that's what they look for, ground-based interferometers. Um, they're looking at stuff like merging compact objects, and they've made already a ton of detections of those, but this covers the high frequency end of the spectrum. Um, if we move further to the left, sort of this middle frequency regime, those would be your space-based interferometers uh, like LISA. LISA does not exist yet. They're still working on it, and who knows when it'll go up, but I'm very hopeful it happens in, God, who knows, decades, but <laughs> I'm hopeful. And they're going to be looking at a completely different set of sources, things like galactic white dwarf binaries, or these things called extreme mass ratio in spirals, among a whole different other uh, set of sources. We're going to move a little bit further to the left, where now the period of these waves are on the order of years, and this is actually uh, what we're focusing on today. These are your supermassive black hole binaries, where the detectors you're using here are the pulsar timing arrays that Lulu went over uh, just a few minutes ago. And then you can go way, way, way to the really low frequency end. And we're talking about things like relic gravitational waves, where I have a question mark there because I'm absolutely in no way qualified to ever talk about this topic at the time being. Uh, very cool stuff, but these are things where we would have to be using the Planck telescope 
um, that's looking at fluctuations within the cosmic microwave background radiation. So again, what we're focusing on today is sort of in this low frequency, not ultra low, but low frequency regime with uh, pulsar timing arrays and supermassive black hole binaries. And then, now that we've sort of built out the uh, frequency space and I explained what uh, strain was, this right here is just showing a couple of those classes of detectors, LIGO, LISA, uh, and Nanograv, those pulsar timing arrays, and kind of showing you the sensitivity that we might have to different types of sources. And particularly at the top here, we have the stochastic background, which is what we're talking about today, and supermassive binaries as the two classes of sources that we are uh, primarily looking for with our experiment. So now with all of that out of the way, let's meet today's contestants. Our sources, I of course am talking about supermassive black hole binaries. These objects are, to put it lightly, very, very cool. Uh, most galaxies, most massive galaxies, uh, including our own, they do contain a supermassive black hole at their centers, a single one. That means that if you have galaxy merger events, they're very likely going to lead to those two black holes forming some kind of binary, a supermassive black hole binary. To give a sense of the scale for these uh, objects, these binary objects, the masses can range from anywhere from 100 million up to 10 billion times the mass of our own sun. And just another interesting little factoid is that while we are pretty certain that they're out there, as of today, they have not yet been directly detected. There are candidates out there, but th there have been no direct detections of an individual supermassive black hole binary. So uh, I'll just also give you a little idea of the life cycle, what a supermassive black hole binary will look like throughout its life, um, all the way from, say, its formation, up to its coalescence and try and give an idea of where we're focusing on um, with the pulsar timing arrays because gravitational waves would provide us an excellent opportunity to sort of study this lifetime, study the life cycle of uh, the formation, the evolutionary properties of the supermassive black hole binaries, how they're interacting with their environment, just to name a couple of reasons why these would be incredibly interesting objects to look at, but particularly where pulsar timing arrays are going to be sensitive is going to be in this part right here during the binary and spiral, which if you can read this axis right here, which is more just time until coalescence, time until merger, can last on the order of millions and hundreds of millions of years. And perhaps if you look all the way over on the far left side of this plot and you get really scared because you see an infinity there uh, and wondering, uh-oh, why is that happening? I'm not going to talk about that and I'm going to leave that for Shashwat later on in the talk. All right, so now with all of that background out of the way, we want to talk about how this is actually going to be affecting the times of arrivals of the pulsars. We need to know what we're actually looking for in our data and how we're going to be able to sort of eke that out uh, and put a model together for the background and, and do some, some kind of statistics on it. So if we just had a single source, here's our Earth. We're very happy today. Uh, beautiful weather outside. And there's pulsars all around it that we're timing, and there's a single source right there. What would the response look like? How would those times of arrival be changing in response to a single source? And as you can see over on the right, you get this thing that we would call a deterministic signal, which means that it can be defined exactly by some mathematical formula or expression. It might be ugly, but we can write it down explicitly if we want to. And in this case, it's a nice little periodic uh, function right there. But that's just one source. What if we had a whole bunch of them and uh, now we're getting a little bit dizzy? Say we had 200 uh, supermassive black hole binaries that are there and this is what we're going to be calling more of a stochastic signal. It's not something we can write down explicitly the waveform for. We're going to need to define it more in terms of a probabilistic model. Uh, so yeah, good luck trying to write down an explicit equation for this. We just can't do it. However, we're not talking about one source, we're not talking about 200 sources. What we're really talking about is the collective signal of the entire cosmic population of supermassive black hole binaries. That is what we are attempting to uh, show is one of the, or not the direct cause of the gravitational wave background. So I bring you back to this characteristic st the strain and the frequency plot, kind of like what I showed previously. And if we took the whole population of binaries, at least simulated the whole population of supermassive black hole binaries, and try to show what the power spectrum, something we could actually maybe detect uh, with our pulsar timing arrays, what it might look like. Well, this is a rough idea as to what that shape might be, that black line. And it's something that we could quantify uh, with one equation right here, roughly, where this would be our amplitude of the gravitational wave background, a very important quantity for us to look at. And then you can just think of this exponent as sort of the, the slope of the line, uh, which can be directly related to how we describe our power spectrum. 
Um, but I am going to end my portion there that we've laid out all the foundations of uh, how we could look for a gravitational wave background and turn it over to Shoshwood as to how do we actually know these signals could be a gravitational wave background. Uh, hello? Yeah, thank you, Gabe. Uh, hello? Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, Gabe and Lulu gave us some of the background, and I'll be going over what we actually saw in our data sets. And to start off with, here is one diagram for, from the 15-year paper. So on the x-axis, here we've got frequency in terms of log. So what this actually means is it's 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 8.5. So this means we're in the nanohertz range, around 10 to the minus 9. And on the on the y-axis here, we've got the delay in our pulsar timing. So as Lulu told us, timers are really good at getting an idea of what the model of a pulsar is supposed to look like. We know very accurately when we're supposed to receive signals from it and when we're not. So this tells us how much we're off by because of some kind of signal within it. So another way to think about this is, at the bottom, the farthest back we can look is how long we've been observing our pulsars for. That's the maximum frequency, uh, that's the minimum frequency we can look back on. And up here, we see that the maximum delay observed in our pulsars is 250 nanoseconds approximately. So another way to think about this is, in 15 years of observing pulsars, we noticed a maximum difference of uh, one ten millionth of a second, which is crazy to think about. Or in other words, over 50 million seconds of observing gave us a difference of point, oh, sorry, point zero 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 two five, which is extremely small. And this was along the lines of what Gabe was talking about, where the strain is really small. So how likely is this signal that we're seeing? How do we know that it's not just a bunch of uh, baloney? You know, how do we know it's not just pulsars doing their weird things and we're seeing something completely unlikely? Well, there's a, uh, there's a statistical tool called the base factor that tells us how likely this is. And it's given in terms of an odds ratio. So if we compare just all the junk that the pulsars do on their own, versus something all the pulsars are doing together or seeing together, we get an odds of one is to 10 to the 12, or one is to a trillion that we are, that this is all just chance. So it's very, very likely, and comparing that to getting struck by lightning, that's a chance of one in 13,500. So we're pretty sure this is what we're seeing. Uh, here's someone getting struck by lightning. Um, so. Now, uh, the first image I showed you was about the common power, but power isn't enough to determine that this is the gravitational wave background. We need some kind of signature. So if we compare all our pulsars with different pulsars, we can see that one pulsar with itself has a bunch of junk stuff that the pulsar does on its own called white noise and red noise, and then there's the signal that we're actually interested in. So there's a bunch of terms we don't really care about. And if we look um, at pulsars that are different, we see that the only thing they share in common is the signal. So it's obviously, easy, it's obviously better to look at these off-diagonal terms, or they're called cross-correlations, instead of the terms down here. The only problem is it's extremely computationally inefficient. So we need some kind of sign from all of these terms that this is what we're seeing, a gravitational wave background. And to talk about that, we need to mention what pulsar pair cross correlations are. So like here, we have two different pairs of pulsars. Here, they're the same. Here, they're different. And if we look at the signals coming from pulsars, example one and two, we can see that the peaks and the valleys line up pretty well. So this tells us that it's positively correlated. They're flowing in the same direction at around the same time. But if we look at pulsar two and pulsar three, we notice that the peaks and valleys are almost flipped. So that means that there's negative correlation. And this is pretty important for our pulsar timing array. So we've got all our pulsars across the sky, similar to what Lulu showed you earlier. And there's some angular separation between the pulsars across the sky. And so this angle is quite important to tell us what kind of signal we need to see. And the more pulsars we have, the more accurate we're going to be, the more sensitive our detector is. So for the 11-year data set, 
We had 34 pulsars and just over 500 pulsar pairs. For the 12 and a half year data set, we had 45 pulsars and just under 1,000 pulsar pairs. But for our 15 year data set, we had 67 pulsars and just over 2,000 pulsar pairs. So what we're seeing is fairly accurate. Now, what, what kind of shape are we expecting to see here? Well, it's this right here. It's the Hellings Downs uh, correlation. And this is really famous because this is what it means to see a gravitational wave. So here on the x-axis, you've got the separation between your pulsars in terms of degrees. So you can have pulsars all across the sky with some separation between them. And this is what we expect to see. So don't worry about this. I know it looks really disgusting. You don't have to learn it. There's no quiz. Um, so for a pair of pulsars that are really close together in the sky in the same direction, we expect maximum positive correlation. For a pair of pulsars that's 90 degrees apart in the sky, we expect minimum cross correlation. And for two pairs, uh, for a pair of pulsars that's in opposite directions in the sky, we expect positive correlation, but not as high as if they were in the same direction. So this is the smoking gun. This up, down, up signature tells us that this is a Hellings Downs. So there's another term that's quite important called the optimal statistic. And this just tells us how loud our signal is. It tells us the amplitude squared. And it also gives us an uncertainty. And if we divide these two, we get a significance, also called a signal to noise ratio. And that just tells us how significant our value is, how, how much it means that this is what we are seeing. So if we take a look at all our data sets and the signal to noise that we saw, you can see that it starts out negative. So we're not really seeing anything around six years. But then it builds up as we get more pulsars and as we increase the time. And if you take a look right here at where our 15-year data set was made, it lands around 4, uh, an S a signal to noise of 4 or 4 sigma. And to put that in terms of odds, there's a 1 is to around 16,000 chance that this is all just chance, that we're not seeing it. So these are pretty good odds. And here is what we actually saw in our data set. This is the Hellings Downs correlation, so you can see this is what we expected to see. The blue dots is our data along with the uncertainty. And you get this nice up, down, up feature, which is what I mentioned. And if you ask me, this looks like a smoking gun. It looks pretty good. Um, so now the question is, now that we've seen it, where do we go from here? What does it mean? We found the big thing. Now we want to know, what do we do? So. One thing to think about is we've only mentioned Hellings Downs as the cross correlation, but there's other noise terms that could exist as well. So here we've got, once again, our Hellings Downs curve. That's the one we like. That's our good curve. And the red curve and the green curve are curves that could be noise. So the red we call monopole. And it's what, it's what would happen if one of our pulsars or a few of our pulsars are timed wrong. So if timers like Lulu get something wrong, then that error cascades throughout an entire data set, and we get positive correlations completely. Luckily, Lulu and timers like her do a great job, so we don't have to deal with this a lot. Um, and if we get the center of our solar system wrong, then as the Earth orbits, this is also going to cascade into errors that look like a cosine curve. Because the, as the Earth rotates, your point of reference is also going to shift along with it. So we get this kind of curve. But general relativity tells us that the only signal we should see is Hellings Downs. So you can get errors, noise errors that show up. So what do I work on? Um, this is just a description. It's mostly the one on the left, but we do what we can. Um, so I actually work on the multi, multiple correlated optimal statistic, which means that we assume more than one signal is present. And when we do that, we can actually rule out signals that aren't there. Or we can, tell, we can see how significant some of the noise is. So here's another plot from our paper. The blue curve is the actual curve we want to see. But you can see this orange curve seems to fit slightly better. And that's because the orange curve is actually more than one correlation. It's what we expect plus the monopole noise term. 
And the fact that it fits slightly better means that there is some noise term within our data set that we have yet to look into. So this is something else that we're looking into is where is this noise coming from? And our amplitude or amplitude squared, our amplitude ends up being around 2.4 or 2.5 times 10 to the minus 15. That's our strain amplitude. And thinking about what Gabe was saying, if we think about this in terms of distance, one meter and 10 raised to minus 15 meters, that's the width of a proton. So these are extremely, extremely small values. And now that we've talked about, the, as Gabe mentioned, sources, we expect these to be supermassive black hole binaries, or SMBHBs. There's a lot of acronyms in the stock. Hope you get used to it. And what this tells us is we need to know how many of these SMBHBs are around us. We want to know what their masses are. We want to know how far back in time they are. So when we look farther back, we're also looking back in time. And that's called redshift. So that's this. And we also want to know what frequency most of them are at. And there's a lot of variables here. But some of our colleagues have actually looked into this and wanted to know what our population of gravitational wave background sources looks like. And here you can see the green and the gray is what our data showed us. And the purple and the blue are simulations of the universe and populations of these supermassive black hole binaries. So there is some overlap which tells us this is likely a signal from supermassive black hole binaries. And so it's not just chance, but there's still a lot of data because there is a lot of gap here. So there's more analysis that needs to be done. And just because I want to scare everyone, here's a really terrible looking equation. I know I feel the same way. Um, but all you have to know is that this depends on frequency, how far back we're looking, the masses, the numbers. And then there's this weird term here that talks about energy of gravitational waves. And this one's pretty interesting because it depends on the environment of the binary. So as Gabe showed you this, uh, a portion of this picture earlier, we, we know that galaxies merge, and it's very likely that supermassive black hole, binar uh, bla black hole binaries form after these mergers. But the issue is, if you start at around one parsec, or 3.26 light years apart, and you lead these black holes to their own devices and let them just come closer because of gravitational wave radiation, it's going to take longer than the age of the universe, which is why you have this question mark or infinity show up sometimes, because we really don't know how they come closer together if you just leave them on their own. So something else has to be going on here that get, makes them come closer and closer quicker than we expect them to. And some solutions to that is scattering. So bl these black holes can be sucking in gas and absorbing gas, which slowly reduces their angular momentum, making them spin inwards. There could be stars or other smaller black holes that get flung out of the system, which also reduces angular momentum, causing them to fall in. So these are some explanations. But as I said, more work needs to be done, more analysis to understand what processes are exactly going on. And this is why it's sometimes called the final parsec problem, because it's around one parsec that these issues start showing up. And as Gabe showed you, we really care about the sub-parsec scales, so when it's less than one parsec. All right, I'm going to hand it back to Gabe then. Yeah. Um, we'll be uh, just passing the mic around quite a bit through the last few sections of this talk. But what I do want to mention is, are there Im any immediate pressing issues that we might have to deal with when we're approaching new analyses with the gravitational wave background and trying to search for things like uh, astrophysical interpretations or, or otherwise? And the answer is, these analyses are really, really, really computationally expensive. This is a video actually from two years ago that Shashua uh, took of me in the office. I was feeling particularly yellow that day. Uh, this is the reality of what the day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day work doing these analyses might look like. We really, really sugarcoated how difficult and long and time-consuming these analyses could take and what really goes into the computational models that we need to run on. Uh, we're often performing statistical analyses with uh, 100 or more varying parameters at once. We've got to model all of our pulsars. We've got to model a gravitational wave background. We might have to model uh, deterministic signals as well in there. And 
when all is said and done, these can take weeks or even months to run. And what are we supposed to do in the interim? But so one thing that we really want to try and do is make these more efficient and speed them up and just find a way to more efficiently uh, traverse some of these high dimensional parameter spaces that we're trying to work with nowadays in uh, pulsar time and race science. And so what I work on in particular is this thing, uh, building a pipeline with what's called this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling algorithm. This is just an algorithm that kind of uses an analog to thermodynamics, it's very cool. Uh, and it uses that to more efficiently explore these higher dimensional statistical models. Um, we're talking 100 plus parameters, it does a much better job of working through those. So, in particular, I just wanted to show an animation right there of how if you had a really weirdly shaped distribution and you use this uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling algorithm as opposed to maybe what we use in a more standard pipeline, how it can do a better job of more fully traversing the uh, full parameter space that we want to explore. And why could this be useful? Well, what's next in line after we have uh, found evidence for the gravitational wave background. And that would be individual source detection. We've got a whole ton of supermassive black hole binaries out there, but what if we just want to try and hone in on one? And we want to say, where are you located in the sky? What, are, what is your mass, your chirp mass? What is your frequency of the gravitational wave emission? And we want to be able to sort of, I don't know, not necessarily find the needle in the haystack here, but find the needle in the, the needle stack, I guess, is how we would phrase it. Um, that's sort of what's next in line. I go back to that plot of all the simulated SMBHPs that I showed during my section, and we want to try and maybe just look at that one dot, or this one dot, or this one, or that one dot, and get parameters just of those individual binaries. Well, it turns out that that really is not easy. And why is that not easy? Because we shot ourselves in the foot by making an important scientific discovery. And that's now we have this gravitational wave background signal that's really cool, but we now have to account for this in all of our models and try and you know, model that along with an individual source. So computationally, these can be incredibly difficult, stressful, and painful searches to do. However, though, finding an individual source really is our next in line uh, objective because this would be huge, huge for multi-messenger astrophysics. We'd be able to say, here is a supermassive black hole binary. It would be the first confirmed detection of a supermassive black hole binary. And we could then you know, tell all of the electromagnetic telescopes out there, hey, just point your telescopes right there. We promise you're going to learn a ton. At the moment, we have not actually detected any individual sources, which is to be expected. So the gravitational wave background was going to be a louder source than the one that we detect first. Uh, but at the time, we are still able to at least set upper limits um, along all of frequency space to say whether or not we should have been able to find uh, individual sources at particular locations. Uh, that's what I at least work on. I'll let Lulu explain what she works on. So we've talked a lot about uh, what are the next steps in uh, detecting uh, not just the GWB, but also detecting individual uh, um, supermassive black hole binary sources. But let's remember, none of this is going to be possible without the timing data sets that astronomers like Gabe and Shashwat use to search for their gravitational waves. And what I work on is uh, basically what is next for um, our timing data sets. And one of the biggest things that's going to be included in Nanograv's next data set is data from a new telescope called the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity uh, Mapping Experiment, or CHIME. Uh, this is a telescope that is, uh, as the name suggests, in Canada, and it's been observing uh, nanograv sources for about uh, nearly a little over four years now. Um, in order for a pulsar to be included in a nanograv data set, it needs to have at least three years of data. So even though technically there is data from before um, uh, nanograv's 15-year cutoff, there wasn't enough to include it in the data set. Um, so one thing that's different about CHIME observations based um, from observations that we've done on the other telescopes is that it observes pulsars at nearly daily cadence, uh, which means there's um, at least one observation per pulsar almost every day. Realistically, it's probably every couple days, uh, just because there's about 45 pulsars that uh, CHIME observes, specifically for nanograv, that doesn't include any of the other science that the telescope does. Um, on our other telescopes, like the GBT, Arecibo, and the VLA, or the Very Large Array, we observe them monthly. Um, and at having this daily cadence is really, really helpful 
for understanding processes that pulsars undergo that happen over relatively short time scales. So say, for example, you could have a pulsar that's in a binary that's maybe five days long. If you're observing it every month, it's not quite as easy to get as much information in within uh, one binary orbit. But if you had daily observations, you could have an observation at each stage of your orbit, and then that would be really helpful for understanding characteristics of it. Uh, it's also helpful for understanding things like the, the solar wind. We've been talking about the effect of supermassive black hole binaries on pulsar timing, but even something as close as the sun can have an effect on our pulsar timing, specifically in something that we call dispersion measure, which is uh, kind of a measure of the amount of stuff between us and the pulsar, the amount of free electrons between us and the pulsar. So higher dispersion measure, more stuff between you and the pulsar. And um, particularly, um, that something we've noticed in chime data is that we're able to resolve really, really well how um, uh, some pulsars that happen to be very close to our line of sight with the sun uh, have uh, these ma massive fluctuations in their dispersion measure, at least relative to uh, the initial dispersion measure over time. So if I can get this working. Okay, so this is an example of um, a dispersion measure across time for one pulsar with uh, chime data. And you can see that it has these three giant peaks. And then uh, um, overlapping are this, are this yellow line. And that yellow line represents the uh, angular separation between the sun and the pulsar. So the important thing to get from this is when the angle between the sun and the pulsar relative to Earth is minimized, we see the biggest change in our dispersion measure. Uh, another thing that I specifically work on is a relatively new timing technique called wideband timing. Uh, now, in uh, most of our nanograph data sets, we do something called narrowband timing, where we, from one observation, we might get several different uh, times of arrival, all at different frequencies. Uh, in wideband timing, we take the assumption of uh, that um, pulse profile, which is in this plot right up here, um, is going to look different uh, in terms of frequency. Uh, in narrowband timing, we account for this by getting a different TOA at various frequencies. But in wideband timing, we say, why don't we model how this pulse profile changes in frequency, uh, create a model of it, and then uh, use that to just be able to calculate a single time of arrival and dispersion measure measurement that um, accounts for how the, that accounts for this uh, frequency dependent information. And one cool thing about uh, wideband timing is that if you have gaps in your data, like um, this, for example, is a plot of, uh, the pulse profile in terms of uh, observing frequency or observing wavelength. And you can see that there's a bunch of areas here that are blacked out. This is data that we had to cut out because um, there was something close to the telescope that was uh, interfering with our data collection. Very specifically, this particular gap up here is caused by 5G, <laughs> which, is, which is fun. <laughs> Um, and one thing that we're able to do with wideband timing is uh, interpolate over these gaps in frequency coverage. Uh, mind you, this doesn't really work if we go past uh, frequencies or wavelengths that we're observing at, but we are able to at least close some of those gaps and be, be able to understand how our pulse profile changes in frequency. Next, uh, in this next part, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what the timeline was like for uh, the three of us working on this project. Uh, so for me specifically, um, nanograv data collection ended in August 2020, which is exactly when I started grad school. Um, so I started working on it almost immediately after I arrived. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I also worked on uh, pulsar searching stuff and a little bit on pulsar timing as well. So that was why I, I was recruited to start working on this. Um, and one thing that we did is um, in the timing group is we didn't just necessarily time the pulsar is handed off to the detection people. Uh, what we did is we did several rounds of uh, timing and then noise analyses. And what I mean by a noise analysis is trying to model out uh, basically any weird shape we see in our um, uh, TOA residuals that are not, uh, that we can't account for with other uh, parts of our model. And so this is an example of a pulsar uh, residual of a pulsar's residual plot where we see this weird kind of almost like a sine wave but not quite really shape 
and we can, but um, we can, we still are timing it pretty precisely. Um, you can see that these residuals are on the order of uh, five to 10 microseconds. This is a pulsar with a spin period of about 1.3 milliseconds, uh, but we can do better. So what we do when we do these noise analyses is usually they take several hours to a few days to run, and then we apply it uh, where we're accounting for uh, different kinds of noise such as, uh, did we make a mistake when we're, we were calculating our TOA uncertainties? Um, are there any weird uh, correlations between observations that were taken on the same day? Or in this case, are there any long-term um, noise, noise sources that are not the gravitational wave background? And then what that gets us are uh, denoised or whitened residuals where everything is centered around zero. And in this case, you can see instead of our residuals being on the order of five to 10 microseconds, they're actually sub-microsecond. And also, we, um, in December of 2020, we experienced a loss of the Arecibo telescope. Uh, unfortunately, the giant receiver on it collapsed um, on December 11th, 2020. So uh, we, we unfortunately, we're never going to be able to get any more data from that telescope. And uh, during happier times, I actually was able to visit it. But this was, I think, in 2018. And next up. Yeah, so I'm just going to be talking about um, why did it take so long? As Lulu showed, it start, uh, data collection ended in 2020, and yet we went on to uh, release these results in 2023. So why did it take that long? Well, um, there was a pandemic. I don't know if you heard. Um, there's also, we need to make multiple checks because we don't want to end up with a mistake where we tell everyone, oh, this is what we're seeing, and it turns out, it wasn't true. That would be very embarrassing. Um, we also need to verify it's real. Um, timers like Lulu need to make sure that they understand all the properties of the pulsar that can be modeled. Um, analysts like Gabe and myself have to do um, massive amounts of computational work that can take sometimes days, weeks, or even months. Some of these runs can take months. Um, we have the IPTA, as Lulu mentioned, and so we have international collaborators that we need to discuss with and agree with that we are all seeing the same thing because if we see something and nobody else is seeing it, then that's kind of strange. So we need to do all of these things and make sure that what we are seeing is right. We need to convince ourselves with the data and the evidence as well as our peers. So this can take quite a while, especially for something this uh, such a big project. And here's actually a plot I made all the way back in 2021 when I first started to work on this project. Um, here's what a meeting during the uh, pandemic times look like. So here we've got some people highlighted who are all affiliated with Nanograph from UWM. For some reason, I'm highlighted. I don't think I was speaking, but uh, not sure. There's also so many more people who have been affiliated with UWM at any stage of their career, some of which are here right now in the talk and aren't the three of us, so thank you for coming. So we've got quite a large list of people. Here's uh, 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 Lulu's advisor, and here's Gabe and uh, my advisor. So quite a few people, and I'm going to hand it to Gabe now. All right, and just to finish the talk, give an idea what it was like leading up to the actual publication of these papers. We've now discussed, we've had three years later of observations and data collection and data cleaning and preliminary analyses. We've got cross-validation and other validation and statistical checks and long Bayesian runs. And we've had paper writing and paper editing and a second round of paper editing. We've had international negotiations, other internal review, et cetera. And we're now at one week left until these papers actually get published. So as you can imagine, it must have been a very stressful time for everybody involved uh, in the project. And just to give an idea of how stressful it was, here's what uh, Lulu, Shashwat, and I were up to then. You can just tell um, <laughs> that, I mean, my goodness, look, look how stressed we look in there. Actually, one week prior to the publication of all of these papers was, coincidentally, the IPTA, or International Pulsar Timing Array, meeting in Port Douglas, Australia, that we traveled to. This happened to be the first International Pulsar Timing Array meeting that had happened in person uh, post-pandemic. So it was very interesting and very fun, not that just we were able to go and participate in the conference, but that this was the first time that we were able to meet face to face a lot of people, not just within our own collaboration, but within the other international uh, collaborations. And by this point, all of our work was done. You know, we, 
the press conferences are going to happen, but we're not involved with that. So all of our work on the project was done. We're just chilling. Uh, and then it comes to June 29th, 2023, just uh, a few months previous to today. And this is paper day, or however we want to phrase it. This was the day that all of the papers went live. So the one that we focused mostly on today, the evidence for gravitational wave background, was published. But that wasn't the only one. There were a suite of other papers, I believe 18, or around eight, 15 to 18 papers that were published on the same day from Nanogrev as well as the other uh, uh, pulsar timing rate collaborations across the world. All released on the same day, very exciting day for gravitational wave uh, science and science as a whole. Of course, we had to celebrate. There was a press conference that happened uh, at NSF headquarters in the DC area and we had our own little thing here at UWM. That of course included this wonderful cake of the Hellings Downs correlation curve. So while that will conclude what we have to say about um, the topic today, I'm gonna end this talk by advertising that if you wanna hear about basically the exact same topic but from a different, different person, there's a UWM Planetarium show that's on Wednesday. It is going to be actually by Shosh Nice PhD advisor. So today you heard it from the source but if you would rather hear it from the source's source, please feel free to uh, show up on Wednesday. I do believe you have to RSVP to this event so if you'd like to go, maybe head to the UWM Planetarium's website and check it out. That will conclude our talk for today. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And an announcement, of course, our last talk of 2023 is going to be in a month's time on December 2nd, where we will be answering a very pressing and heated question uh, that we have been wondering ever since 2006, and that is, what in the world ever happened to Pluto? So thank you again for coming. We hope to see you again in December. And we're now happy to take any questions. Yes. So the question was, when we're doing these computations, these very hefty computations, what's the actual infrastructure uh, that we're running them on? I mean, we have supercomputing clusters that we utilize. Uh, as far as the actual infrastructure of those clusters, that's not something that I really know off the top of my head. I just know that they work, and they work fast enough for our purposes. I don't know if you know the actual specs of it. Um, there's, there's a few. Um, we, also, we also mostly code in Python, so that's one of the major infrastructures we use. Um, both, yeah. So we actually make use of both because we can run certain smaller runs on our own laptops, but for some of the bigger things, we definitely make use of the cluster because it's just so much more powerful and you don't have to turn off your computer at some point. <laughs> also, one thing we did uh, for coordination purposes, because we had a lot of people working on all these different things, um, especially on the timing side, we used uh, something called GitHub, which is a really good uh, resource for doing collaborative coding, but it's also where we would upload our results, do cross checks, et cetera. Um, and also we would all use a cloud-based uh, Jupyter Notebook server in order for everybody to be using the same code. Well, so the question was uh, directly related to the work that I do in this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm that I said uses some sort of thermodynamic an or analog to thermodynamics um, to be able to more efficiently explore the parameter space. Believe me, I'm more than happy to talk to you for like 30 minutes about this um, after the talk. Uh, anyone else is also welcome to ask me about this for 30 minutes after the talk. But roughly speaking, um, one thing I'll mention is that when you take thermodynamics in graduate school, if you didn't know, it actually has a different name. It's called statistical mechanics, and that's because there's a direct relation to when we break stuff down to microscopic scales that things behave statistically. And so that is why, at least in this way, this algorithm can sort of draw an analog from statistical mechanics, thermodynamics. Um, it's called the Hamiltonian. It's just sort of a way of, uh, it's just, or function, it's defining the energies of your system and evolving that system through time 
So say you had a couple of particles and you want to know, you want to evolve those system, that system through time, they have some sort of potential between the two. Well, what if we're not talking about particles, we're talking about parameters in a statistical model? It turns out that the same type of uh, equations that, that define the motion of this many particle system can also be used to basically any arbitrary statistical model. So you just have to be able to code up the equations in a different way so that it follows Hamiltonian mechanics instead of a more traditional Monte Carlo sampling algorithm which may just do things uh, as in terms of a random walk. So it's just a little bit more sophisticated. Obviously there's more computational overhead to add in these extra equations but that's effectively how it works and again I'm always happy to talk about this more afterwards. What's your funding source? What's our funding source? NSF. NSF. They like us. Oh, really? Yes. And they really like us now because of uh, <laughs> what, we just, what we just showed over the summer. Yes. I used to pay for NSF software. Oh. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it does. Um, I realize I didn't mention it. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is, uh, what kind of observations does CHIME do? And I realize I did not mention that CHIME looks a lot different than the other radio telescopes uh, that I showed. It still uh, functions in the same way, uh, sort of. Uh, where the way that CHIME takes its observations is that um, it's immobile, so it's just always pointing at the sky, and it can take in data. Um, and then you basically time your observations for whatever the pulsar that you want to look at is within CHIME's field of view. Oh, um, because, sorry. <laughs> okay, so about uh, chi the hydrogen intensity mapping part of CHIME's name. Uh, that's because uh, CHIME was initially funded to do um, hydrogen mapping of the galaxy. Uh, that's uh, initially what the, I think the funding was uh, uh, meant for, and then it just kind of serendipitously also ended up being really, really good for um, pulsar science and also for um, another type of object called a fast radio burst, which is um, kind of, which is also observed in the same uh, wavelength as pulsars, but instead of being uh, regular pulses, they're just kind of one-off, very loud events. Yeah, so the question was um, that dark matter could be related to black hole binaries, you said? Right, so um, we're not actually working on those projects, but we do have co colleagues that work um, on dark matter theories such as fuzzy dark matter when it comes to PTA sciences. So using some of the measurements of our data sets, they do um, look for dark matter models that fit, but um, I, I, I don't think any of us know about that uh, line of work exactly. But you're counting black hole binaries, Yeah, we, we don't actually count the black hole binaries. We are just seeing the effect of all of them. Um, like Gabe mentioned, uh, the individual uh, black hole binary problem is quite hard to solve. It's hard to detect uh, one individual source at a time. So what we really see is the combined effect of all of them. So yeah, we, we haven't been really able to count them or point out where they lie on the sky as of now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, thank you again for showing up. Check out some of the merch that we have down in, uh, by the entrance.